Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. And I happen to have a somewhat old computer file. Uh, so I'll also say some things which are not in the file, maybe. But, and given that we just had lunch up to two minutes ago, then there's even a le less time for the talk. So, so I thought it would be a good idea to use the file and on the one hand, and on the other hand, to stop talking and just start saying. So just saying about the problem. So. So what is DLA? So, uh, so some of you asked me this week, what is this? So it's. Uh, so I'll start by saying what the classic DLA model is. So it was introduced in the early 80s as a model for crystal growth, and later it turned out that there are several other physical phenomena that are also approximated by the same heuristic. So among them is some liquid interfaces and several other problems as well. And it's been very popular since then. So if you search Google, there are almost 20 million uh, web pages with DLA. And I also checked earlier with Microsoft Search. So it's uh, comparable. I think it uh, was so a for that's a good point. So on Microsoft, it's 14 million. But if you change it to diffusion limited aggregation, which is what it stands for, then it reduces to, to half a million and uh, something like 40,000 uh, on your search, search engine. So what are the other things DLA stands for? I, I, like um, uh, there's some, some uh, I think the, tops, the top result is some federal agency in the US, uh, but I, di I didn't memorize the, the initials. And it's been studied quite a lot. There are really a whole bunch of papers. So I think if you, depending on what exactly you search for, you can find between tens and a couple of hundreds on a math sci net, for example. But most of them are just heuristics and arguments uh, for why things should do. And some of them talk about variations on the model, which are not as interesting. Uh, very few things are actually known about this model. So what is the model? Uh, so you, st you grow an aggregate in the plane. So this is so the classical model is in two dimensions. So you have a two-dimensional lattice. You start with a single point, which is stuck at the origin. And now you start another point. You take another particle, which starts far away. And it's going to do a random walk. And at some point, it's going to hit the cluster that you already have, the single point. And the moment that it hits it, it gets stuck. And it's just glued there, and it never moves again. So then you add a second point, then you add a third point. Each time you, you forget about the path that the random will take, you only, take, you only care about where it is glued to the cluster. So Does it matter in which direction it starts far away? OK, so that's a, that's a good question. And in the, in the case of a two-dimensional lattice, it doesn't matter because it's going to go many times around the cluster, around the finite set before hitting it. So formally, the way this is done is by taking a starting point which goes to infinity. And limiting the starting point. And this is the question of the harmonic measure, of existence of the harmonic measure. And for the two-dimensional lattice, the harmonic measure exists for any finite set. And, and in, in fact, this means that the growth can be described by the, the, growth ra the growth rate at any given point is given by the harmonic measure at that point. So this is what you get if you simulate this model. Um, so one of those uh, is a computer simulation uh, of the exact model that I described before with a certain large number of particles. The other one is an actual physical experiment where you take particles on a, on, in a plate and you, and you charge them in some way so that they tend so that once they touch the other particles, they'll stick. And, and you let an aggregate go like that. Um, Yes, so that's the experiment. But you can see that they look fairly similar. And there are a lot of interesting questions about this picture. So you see 
that you get some kind of a fractal object and you want to prove something about it. Um, the simplest question would be may to say what is the dimension. Okay, not the simplest, but the most interesting question is what is the dimension of this thing? And for example, you can as say that the dimension is, relate, is the relation between the number of particles and the diameter. You can say that the number of particles is the diameter raised to the power of the dimension. So you want to estimate the diameter. So since this is a set of endpoints, a connected set of endpoints in the square lattice, so you know that the diameter is between square root of n and n. And the simulations suggest that you have some number. What does this button do? Uh, yes. So, so <coughs> the simulations suggest some number between the two. And almost the only known results about this model uh, are results of Kesten from the end of the late 90s. So he also analyzed this in d dimensions. And he says that the diameter is bounded by n to the 2 over d plus 1 uh, asymptotically with high probability. And in the case of three dimensions, you have some log factors to correct this. I'm sorry? So this, is, so this is for any dimension in Zd. In particular, if d equals 2, then you get n to the 2 thirds. So, so, this, so this improves the upper bound. So this improves the upper bound from n to n to the 2 thirds. The lower bound is still square root of n. So, you can, so if you can get something that's, oh, that's noticeably bigger than square root of n, it would be very interesting for a lot of people. Um, I should say there's also one result so unpublished in a thesis uh, that DLA in the square lattice is not actually a tree. So if you look at it, it looks like a tree, but actually you have some microscopic say, circles, which some microscopic holes which are closed. You'll have infinitely many of those, but but you don't. We don't know that there's any large scale holes. So in the large scale, it appears to be a tree. Have a positive density of holes. Um, the proof is not for a positive density. The proof just shows that that you'll have infinitely many holes, and I don't. I would expect that there's no positive density, but but proving anything is extremely difficult. Um, okay, so before going to one dimension, I should say so there are several variations of this that have been studied. The uh, the most uh, the, the best understood one is called internal DLA, where the random particle starts at zero every time, and it gets stuck whenever it leaves the set. And in this case, the results are not so interesting. You get a circle. So it's possible to prove very accurate results, but very accurate estimates, but, but it's just a circle. So it's not nearly as interesting. So this is a variation. One-dimensional DLA is a variation on two-dimensional DLA. We actually capture some of the some of the interesting properties of the two-dimensional model, and still we can say some things about it. So, if you just do dimensional DLA in one dimension, as I said it before, it's trivial. You just get an interval. So, so the the biggest change that we need to make is that the random walk is a large has large jumps now. So we have some distribution on the integers, and the random walk is just and sum of IID steps with some distribution. So this is uh, so this is something that is in many models. So you'll have low, long range percolation, you'll have long range random walks on Z, and you ex and the random walks themselves exhibit some of the things that you see in higher dimensions. So so that's a natural way to to somehow approximate the higher dimensional objects by a two dimension by a one dimensional question. And one more thing that we need to change is the, the rule for gluing a particle. Since if we stop once the particle hits a neighbor of the set, then we get again the same thing. We just get an interval. So what we do is we let the random walk, we let the random particle do a random walk. And we stop it once it hits the set exactly. Not a neighbor, but exactly. So, so if this is z, and you have some some points here which are in the set. So the random particle will start at infinity. It will maybe do a random walk like that. 
at some point it hits a particle in the set. So we see what is the last place where it's been. And this is the point that we're going to add to the, uh, to the aggregate. And this is a small variation. And you can do similar simulations in two dimensions. And it doesn't appear to make a very big change. So, so it appears that it's very similar. But, but that's a technical change that we need to make. And finally, the, it turns out that the behavior of the, of the work actually depends very much on what the step distribution x is. And it turns out that the interesting parameter to look at is, is denoted as alpha, which is the largest finite moment that the steps have. So I assume that the steps are symmetric, but they have finite moments up to some alpha and, and no longer. And the simplest example is that the probability that the step is larger than t decays like t to the minus alpha. Now, one more, one more thing relating the one, dim the, relating the one dimensional process with long jumps to, to the two dimensional case is what happens if the steps are just plus or minus one or plus or minus k. And you should think of the asymptotics when k is large. So in this case, the steps are bounded. So this means that this aggregate is, can't have a very long large hole. It can't have a hole of more than k. So the diameter is at least n and at most k times n. So, so the growth rate is linear. But you want to know what is the growth rate exactly. So I, I claim that this is something that's somehow related to the two-dimensional object because this is just a random walk on, on a graph that's drawn there. So you have z and you have the long range edges of constant length. And you can redraw this graph like that. So you just have, so you just cut z into segments of length k and you rotate each one and you draw them vertically. So you get a cylinder here. So you have a strip which is where the top is connected to the bottom with a slight shift. So if you do, a, if you do DLA on, on this kind of thing, so You'll if k is very large, you'll expect that initially you'll grow something like the, like the DLA picture here, except that at some point you'll start to, see, to feel the fact that it's a cylinder. At some point, it will hit itself. And after that, what happens is that you'll grow a branch, a branch here. And you expect this branch to look more or less like the branches in two-dimensional DLA. So, so at least it's reasonable to, to, to say that if you can if you can find the asymptotic growth rate for this random walk, then it, uh, it might tell you something about uh, two-dimensional DLA. Or at least, certainly, they are related. Well, this is the main result. And actually, there are some, I, w I will not talk about all of this here, but what we see is that we have here, so what do we have here? So we have here alpha, which I said before what it is. Alpha is the number of finite moments that the random walk has. And beta is the rate of growth of the diameter. So, so this theorem is just a lower bound on the diameter. We say that if the, if the diameter, if the probability that you make jumps of size t, size bigger than t, is roughly t to the minus alpha, then the growth rate is n to the beta. And what do we see here? So, so of course, the natural thing to expect is that if alpha is small, then you make much longer jumps. So you expect the, the, um, you expect the aggregate to go faster. But this doesn't tell you how much faster. And, and this is what you see. So if alpha is bigger than 3, then it's nothing interesting. Then you just get linear growth. So this is just like if the random steps are bounded. And this holds up to alpha equals 3. Then you have some kind of a transition. And if alpha is smaller, then it starts to grow. And in fact, it grows until alpha equals 2. And so it's 2 over alpha minus 1 there. But then you have the second transition at, at alpha equals 2. So at alpha equals 2, it stops growing. And if you shrink alpha even more, then something funny happens. So you make lo longer and longer jumps for with random walk. But the rate of growth of the aggregate stays fixed. It stays on the order of n squared. 
Uh, finally, when alpha is less than 1, then it starts to grow again. Eventually, it goes to infinity. Um, now, so this, is, so this is the lower bound. And this theorem is actually uh, an agglomeration of several, several theorems for the different regions. And each of them requires some different techniques, but there are a lot of similarities, though. Uh, the upper bounds are not are not as good, but still they still. So when alpha is bigger than three, then this is exact. When alpha is between two and three, we have uh, an upper bound which is just a linear interpolation. And when alpha is between one and two, it is fixed. So between one and two, we can show that it's exactly fixed, and and this shows that it's it that you actually have the transition exactly at two and three. And the case between zero and one, so so I think so there may be an upper bound now, but I'm not sure what it is, so I will not speak about it. Um, so I'll start by so we have this uh, this graph here with several different regions, and I'll start by speaking about some special cases, which also historically are the first cases we considered, but it turns out so that these cases are, on the one hand, simpler to deal with. On the other hand, the tools that you use there and the ideas that you use there are also useful for the for more general uh, results, for more general random walks. So I'll start by focusing on some of those. And the first one is the z-squared restricted walk. So the z-squared restricted walk, we just have a random walk on z-squared. And you have z embedded in z-squared. So you can do it either along a line or in diagonal in any reasonable way. And then you just restrict the random walk to times that it visits z. So this gives you some random walk on z with, low, with unbounded jumps now. So the jumps have approximately Cauchy distribution. And in particular, the tail is 1. So alpha is going to be 1 here. And OK, and in this case, we have beta equals 2. So that we claim that the growth rate is z is n squared. Is that a problem? Um yes, so if you so you so it's possible to rescale it and get Cauchy. Yes. So, so this is a discrete Cauchy mm -hmm. variable. So you can think that if you make if you make a step up, if you have z horizontal and the first step is up, and then the hit, you ask where does it hit the line, so so this is a discrete version. If you if it was a if it was a Brownian motion, it would be exactly Cauchy. So um, so that's so that's an interesting question. Yes, and uh, one thing that you could do is have weights on on the edges, so not use z squared, but but use some kind of a weighted z squared, where let's say that the horizontal edges have a weight that depend on their height. And if the if the horizontal edges have weight that depend on their height uh, as a power of the height, then you can get you can get stable variables. So they would all be symmetric, but you can get yeah. So you can get uh, so there is some some relation between between the the rate and and the parameter of the stable, um, stable variable. Uh, okay, so it's not exactly stable. What you can get is that it's uh, approximates stable. In the, um, so you, well, you can get. Uh, so you can estimate the tail. It's not uh, it's not too difficult to estimate the tail probability of getting a very large jump. So so to make a very large jump, you need to you need to go to a certain height, and and given the height that you go to, you can estimate how far you go and how many how many horizontal steps you make, and and then you have this trade-off between uh, the the improbability of getting very far up and the bonus that it gives you for making large jumps. So what does and what does approximately n squared mean? So 
so that's one way of uh, stating it uh, up to logarithmic or log log corrections. Uh, I'm not going to get into the exact details, but um, essentially we prove some estimates, and it's possible to use these estimates in any way you like, either to get either to get uh, limb soup or limb inf results, or to get uh, estimates in probability, uh, depending on what what you're aiming for. So here's the lower bound. So we want to show that the diameter grows quickly. And what we do is as follows. So we let's assume that the diameter at time n is small. It's smaller than some fixed m, some m. And we want to estimate the probability that after one more step, the diameter is going to be very large, larger than m. So what do we do? We take this set A, and we have here the convex hull of A. So A is the red point. And then we pad this by, by a window of size m on either side. And altogether, we call this the interval i. Uh, so this picture is not very good because m is supposed to be larger than the diameter of a, and it's uh, clearly not, but, but, but assume that it is. So now we have a random walk on z squared, and we want to estimate the probability that uh, that this random walk is going to cause a particle to be glued to A outside this interval, which means that the diameter after the next step will be larger than M. So how do we do this? Well, one way to do this is if the, f the first time that the random walk hits the interval, it hits it in some point of A. Because if this is what happens, so this is as it's drawn here, because if this is what happens, then the last time it was in Z is at this point here, which is outside the interval. So that's the point that we're going to glue to the aggregate. Well, at this point, we can say that the harmonic measure on an interval in Z squared is fairly well understood. And in particular, the, the mass is slightly, con slightly more concentrated towards the edge, towards the endpoints of the interval. The, the most likely point is at the endpoint of the interval. But any point in the middle, any point in the interval at all, has prob the probability of the harmonic measure of any point is at least some constant over the length of the interval for some universal constant. So in particular, we have n points that are in the set A. So the probability of hitting at one of them is some constant times n divided by the length of the interval. And if we assume that the set A has diameter less than m, then it's some constant times n over m. So this gives us some estimate on the probability that the diameter is going to be large. And this essentially concludes the lower bound, because now we can just take m equals n squared, and you see that so you get a constant over n. So you see that infinitely often, you're going to have the diameter larger than n squared. And, uh, and you can guess the variations to get uh, lim soup and lim inf results, so a lim inf result in this case. For the upper bound, <coughs> so for the upper bound, this is a key formula that we use. And this is true in much larger generality. But what does it say? So we have here the probability starting at infinity that you hit x. So tx is the hitting time of x. So we have the probability that you hit x before you hit a. Then you have the probability that you make a step from x to a. So that's the two things that need to happen in order to glue the point x. But you have also this denominator. So this denominator is the probability starting at x that you return to, that you hit a before you hit x. The reason you have this is just that it's possible that the random walk will so it's possible that the random walk will hit x, and a is somewhere here. But then maybe you'll make some loop and return to x again. So it's possible that you'll have many chances to, to make a step from x to a. Can you all hear me without this? Hmm? Um, so, so this probability just gives you the expected. So this denominator exactly straightens for compensated for the expected number of times that you'll visit x before you visit the set A. And, and of course, at each time that you have, you have some probabilities of making a step from x to A and, and ending the random walk. So 
the first term in the numerator uh, together with the denominator are exactly the Green's function for the random walk. Right. But then you also have this probability of making a step from x to a. Now, for the case What's of z. The notation on the left hand side, what does mu stand for? Ah, mu is the gluing measure, the probability of, yeah. of gluing the, se the point x to a set a. Okay. So that's a distribution <coughs> on the points outside a. Yes. Okay, now in the case of the z-squared random walk, again, we understand the random walk fairly well. So we can say quite a lot about, about all of these S quantities. So the probability that you make a step from the probability that you hit A before you, that you hit X before you hit A is at most 1. And it's good enough for us. In fact, it's not much less than 1. the probability that you return to x before you hit a is roughly 1 over log of the distance. So that's fairly easy to see because the probability that, so if the distance is rho, let's, so rho is the distance between x and, and the set a. So if the distance is rho, then the probability, when you start at the point x, the probability that you'll reach a distance rho before you return to x is roughly 1 over log rho, a constant over log rho. And once you, wet, once you reach this distance, the probability of hitting the set A is roughly a constant, is bounded from 0 and 1. So, so that's this probability. So this tells us that the probability that we are going to glue x to the set A is something like log of the distance times the probability of making a step from the set point x to the set A. So. Now you need to sum this up over all the points x that are far away from the set A. And you know the probability of any given, of a jump of any given size. So you can estimate this. And what you get is that the probability that the change in diameter, so this, so delta dn is just a change in the diameter. The probability that it's bigger than m is bounded by some constant times n times log m over m. So this is almost the same as we had for the lower bound, except that we have this log m factor. And again, this using this, it's fairly easy to get some tail estimate for the diameter itself. So morally, uh, you should think that this tells you that the change in diameter is bounded by a, by a Cauchy random variable. It's stochastically dominated by, by a Cauchy random variable. So you have this log correction, which uh, you need to deal with. And you have a problem because the Cauchy random variable might be negative. But morally, you should think that this is, that, it's that the increments in the diameter are bounded by, by n times, times, the Cauchy, times independent Cauchy random variables. And this gives you some estimate on, on the tail of the sum. Um, in fact, all these uh, complications uh, make it easier to just uh, do the calculations and just to make the estimates directly with the probabilities. But, but this is fairly standard and nothing terribly exciting here. So I'll skip the details of how to derive the tail estimate from this. The important thing here, though, is that the upper and lower bound for the probability of, of gluing a point are, are more or less the same. Or the, lower, the bounds for the, for the increment in the diameter are more or less the same so the only difference is the log m factor. So we have this graph. And the z squared case happened here, exactly when alpha is 1. Um, what, what I'm going to speak now is about what happens for alpha less than 1. And when alpha is less than 1, you have one problem because the random walk is transient. So, so you need slightly to make a slight change in the diameter. And in fact, the, again, the, uh, an example from alpha less than 1 is the z cubed restricted walk. And in this case, you even have alpha equals 0. <coughs> so. The z cubed restricted walk is defined in the same way as the z squared restricted walk, except you start with z cubed. 
And here you have a problem. So you're, you are going to hit the line. So you have a line embedded in three dimensions, and you're going to hit it. But you tend to make very large steps. The probability of step of size t are uh, uh, a constant over log t. And the random walk is transient, so the random walk on Z is also going to be transient. And in fact, this, as I said, this happens up to alpha equals 1. So the transience is easy to get around. You just do the same process. You start a random walk at Y and stop it once it hit the set A, except that now we need to condition on the fact that you hit the set A at some finite time. So t is the hitting time of A. You run the random walk, and you look at where it was one step before you hit the set A. And this is the point that you add to the, to the set. So this is, so it's possible to define this model for transient random walks. Um, of course, you have the problem of whether this limit exists. So for recurrent random walks, there is a very general theorem that tells you that the harmonic measure for any, random, any recurrent random walk on Z always exists. So you can always take a limit when the starting point goes to infinity, and you will have a limit. For transient random walks, it's not always the case. So it's not very difficult to construct random walks where you do not have this limit. And this is, we have the following theorem. So this is something that we, we thought would be known, but, but it's not. Or at least we couldn't find it anywhere. So what does this say here? So we have some random walk which is transient and aperiodic. And maybe I'll draw a picture for this. <coughs> so you have some set A. And this theorem is not is also has a variation in two dimensions. So I'll just draw it in two dimensions. So you have a random walk from some point y, which is close to infinity. And you stop it once it hits the set A. So you condition on hitting the set A and stop it once it hits. And you want to know what's the probability of hitting it at the point x. So of course, you can reverse this random walk. And what you get is a random walk starting at x that, that you know has to hit the point y. And it has to avoid the set A. And you can think that if the point y is very, is very far away, then this is approximately the probability that the random walk at x starts at x and just goes to infinity without hitting, just goes to infinity without hitting the set A. So this is denoted Ea of A. So it's the escape probability. So, so if this is if this point is A, then, then, then that's what we have there. So it's natural to expect that the that the harmonic measure on a set is going to be the escape probability. So you need to normalize this, of course, to get a distribution, a probability distribution. But, but you expect the harmonic measure from infinity to be equal to the escape probability you know, times some normalization of the set A. So, so it turns out that this is indeed the case in a fairly large generality. And in fact, the theorem there says that if for some, if for some finite set A uh, of more than one element, the harmonic measure exists, so all we assume is that the limit exists, then you can deduce from this that it's, that it's equal to the normalized escape probabilities. And in fact, for every set A, it's going to be equal to the normalized escape probabilities. And this also has a third uh, characterization, which is equivalent to, to the fact that these harmonic measures exist, which is that if you look at the green function, then g of x plus 1 divided by g of x converges to 1 as x goes to infinity. So. This is equivalent to the to this statement. Um, so, 
so the proof of this was quite nice. So if you're interested, I can try the proof, or I can say some more things about so what happens in the DNA. The working Yes. So for the for the Z cubed block, the, it was known that this measure exists, uh, and that you had this formula. Mm. So this was this is classic, but for general run, general transient random walks, uh, yeah, it's not. Um, okay. So perhaps I'll say later a few words about the proof of this theorem. But I'll speak first about how this how this applies to how we can use this in the Z cubed restricted walk. So in the Z-cube restricted walk, so we had alpha equals 0. And as I said, this beta goes to infinity. So, so here beta is already equal to infinity. And in fact, we have super exponential growth. So, so for any constant k, the diameter is going to be bigger than k to the n infinitely often. And we first need a lemma, which says that for any for any point x and any set A, we have this bound on the escape probability. So the escape probability is at least a constant over the log of the size of the set. And basically, this is the idea. So we have z inside z cubed here. And you can take this cylinder of some radius, which we are going to fix later. We're going to choose later. But we know that there is some probability that you're going to hit the cylinder before you get back to, the, to z. And this probability is approximately a constant over the logarithm of the radius. Because if you look at it from above, you just see a random walk in two dimensions. So you have the probability that a two-dimensional random walk reaches the circle before getting back to where it started. And once you hit this cylinder, then you are quite far from z. And, and of course, the random walk in three dimensions is transient. So if there's a point that's far away from you, you're not likely to hit it. So the probability that you hit any, any point in z, any particular point in z, is at most some constant over the radius. In particular, if you, can, if you use just a union bound now, the probability that you hit the set A from some point on the cylinder is small. It's at most a constant times the size of A over the radius. And finally, you can take the radius, which is, uh, say, the size of the set squared, so you get and so you just get that the escape probabilities, as was claimed there. And of course, once you have this claim, then again, the, the proof is similar to the proof of the lower bound we had in z squared in some way. So we want to estimate the probability that we make a very large increment to the diameter. OK, so we have, the, so we have a similar formula. So this is a formula that's analogous to the formula we had for for recurrent random walks, for transient random walks, the probability that you had a, that you add a set x again by by reversal argument. So it's the probability that you so you have some probability for a step from x to a. But then you need to normalize by the probability of escaping from x. So so you can think of something like this. So this is x and this is some point a. So you can think that the probability that you'll add x is the probability that you hit x and then make this step into the set A. So if you reverse it, you, have a you still have the step from x to A. But this part is now a random walk from x that's conditioned to avoid the set A. So, so you have this formula for the escape, for the gluing probability for a transient random walk. And it's not difficult to, to prove this using the theorem for the, the characterization of the harmonic measure. And the, OK, and so for any particular point A, so the probability that we glue x uh, to a specific point A here by making a step to a specific point A has this bound. It's the probability of a step between x and A divided by n log n. So why is n log n? So the escape probability is at least a constant over log n. And the normalizing factor is at most A, is at most n, because the normalizing factor is just so. The normalizing factor is just the sum of the escape probabilities. So if we have a set of size n, it's at most n. So this is a, an estimate for the probability of gluing a, a point x to a particular point a. And of course, you, again, you can sum this over points which are far, far enough. And you get, 
you have n choices for a point in the set in the set so so this cancels out the n in the denominator and you can sum this over all points uh, which are far away so the probability of a large step is roughly a constant over log of the distance so this is what you get a constant over log m log n and if you take m to be k to the n then this is still not summable so infinitely often you'll have that the diameter is bigger than a constant to the n um, now this is some surprising result so in the z cubed case so y you see that the diameter goes super exponentially so uh, you have n points which are spread out over an over a, a set which is bigger than any constant to the n but it turns out that if you look at time infinity so once you've added all the particles and you have an infinite set it turns out that this set is z so you have very large holes but eventually they all get filled up and the proof is not very difficult so you just estimate the probability that you're going to glue a particular point x and you have the escape probability, the probability of, of the step and the capacity and you get that it's at least a constant over n log n just by taking the probability that you glue it to a specific point in the set A, just the probability that you glue it to, to zero and this is, this is not summable so, so obviously at some point you're going to glue x to the set A And one of the uh, one of the interesting questions about this uh, model that we do not know how to answer is for which random walks do you have this do you have this uh, phenomenon that the diameter goes quickly but eventually you close up all the holes so so the phenomenon that at time infinity the the infinite aggregate is just z. Um, Okay, so I've said some things about what happens at 1 and what happens at infinity at 0. Um, so, so a few things about what happens for larger alpha. When alpha is bigger than 3, then things are very easy. And, and essentially what we say is that when you have a finite second moment, then the random walk on the large scale it looks like Brownian motion it has the same Brownian motion the same scaling limit but you have a change here so when you make a large step then you're much more likely to get to an area where you weren't before and then you have a chance of hitting the set the set A and in particular when you make a step of size K then you're roughly K squared times more likely because when you make a step of size K it takes you out of a window of size K and typically you spend the last k squared steps inside this window so so that's so steps uh, so large steps are t have, a, have a bonus of the size squared for for getting to a new region now the green function of the random walk still grows so is determined by the second moment so it's determined by the large scale behavior and it will grow linearly so so the probability that you, so this thing that we had in the denominator, the, pro, the, the number of times that you return to x before you hit the set A, so this is roughly the distance. This is the same for, <coughs> for every point, but because the large jumps are, so this is the same for every walk when, with alpha bigger than 2, but because the large jumps are much more likely to, to hit the set A, then the change in the diameter has two, two moments less than than the say, than the random walk steps. So if the random walk has finite alpha moments, then the rate of the the growth of the aggregate is going to have only two minus alpha finite moments. And you can do this calculation that uh, essentially summing this up over all f all far away x, you get that the probability that the diameter grows by more than m decays like m to the two minus alpha. So if alpha is bigger than 3 then it means that you have finite expectation the growth the growth of the of the aggregate has finite expectation so after n steps it grows linearly 
If you have less than three finite moments, then it starts to, it has infinite expectation, it has less than one finite moment. So it will go super linearly and you get some, and you get some, you get some growth. And so, so if you just use this bound that I said, then you get the bound two to the m to the two minus alpha, then you get a bound of one over alpha minus two for the growth rate just by yes, bounding this by a sum of stable random variables. Uh, yeah. Who is the simplest way? And this is not quite the, the truth that we have there. Uh, the way to get to the truth is essentially to get a, a separate bound. And, and this is a similar, a similar argument, but you do the summation in a different way. And what you get is that the probability that the change in the diameter is bigger than is bigger than m is also bounded by some constant times n times m to the 1 minus alpha. And this gives you, this gives you a second bound, but if you use the better one of the two bounds, if you just use 4. So this bound is better. So the, the first bound is better when m is small. The second bound is better when m is much larger than n. So for large jumps, we use the, f the second bound. For small jumps, we use the first bound. And together, it gives the upper bound of 4 minus alpha, of n to the 4 minus alpha for the diameter. Um, let's see. So, so that's what happens for the upper bound. Um, so, I'm, so my time is almost up. So I could say some things about the lower bounds uh, between 2 or 3, or some things about what happens between 1 and 2. Or I could show you a proof of the theorem for existence of the of the harmonic measure for transient walks. So, so I think I should put it to a vote at this point. Let's see. So, what do you know between zero and one? Uh, you say you <coughs> have a, a lower bound. Um, um, let's see. Um, no, the the lower bound. You know. Uh, Precisely, you didn't tell us the upper bound. Is that uh, so? These are things that we are that we are still trying to uh, to do at this time, and I'm not completely sure what the, what the, what currently the best low and upper bounds we have are. Um, but it's enough to see that there is a transition at, at uh, yes. one. Yes. Yes. So essentially, you need to get some estimate on the. On the one hand, you need some estimate on the capacity of a set A on the on the sum of the escape probabilities, and on the other hand, you need some estimate similar to to what we had for Z cubed for the probability to escape from any given point, and you need to combine this to get. So if you combine these bounds, you get some bound the, the rate of growth of the diameter. Mm -hmm. So then there's the question of what what are the best bounds that you can get on the capacity and escape probabilities, and so if, so, so that's so that's a separate question, and we don't uh, we don't have a matching bounds for those. So we, so there is a gap there. And um, so in all these estimates, when you uh, when you do your estimate, you uh, have to think about the geometry of A n, and then. Um, as far as I could see, you always say, well, all I know is that it has n points and it's within a, an interval of a given mm -hmm. diameter. Yes. So you, is that enough to do all of these estimates? Um, well, it's enough to do the estimates that are, that are in here. Uh, but uh, it's a good point. So this is exactly the reason for the gap here. And in fact, if you, so if you make some, uh, some heuristic, uh, let's say that the set A is is within some window and that it has some reasonable fractal structure, so that within uh, some intervals you, so that within uh, an interval of which is some power of the of the diameter, you have the prop the, the same power for the number of points. So. So if you say that. Uh, Let's say that you have diameter which, which is d, and 
let's assume that, so this is approximately n to the beta, and let's assume that within a window here of size k, the number of points here is going to be on the order of, uh, of um, so it should be k to the 1 over beta. So if you, so this means that y you have some, in some sense you have the same dimension at every scale. But if you look at the set here, you have the same dimension as for the whole set. So if you, if you make some kind of assumption like that, then you can show that, that actually the lower bound is correct. Uh, so this requires some better understanding of the, of the structure of the set A. And, and that's something that, uh, that with, for these results, we, we don't use it. And, and that's part of the, the and that's in some sense the reason why these results are lacking. But you believe that to be true? Yes. Okay. Mm. Okay, so. Uh, hmm? Well, perhaps. So we started a bit late, but I don't know how much time I have left. Uh, so. Well, you can, you can go on for 10 more minutes. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so, so one of the uh, interest, so I think the most interesting phenomenon here is this interval here where we have, where we have a set which is of, where you increase alpha and so let's get back to this. And so between 1 and 2, you have this whole interval where you change alpha, and the, the growth rate of the diameter doesn't change. And this is something that, uh, that was very surprising uh, initially, because you have random walks that make lar larger and larger jumps, and, and still the aggregates look more or less the same. And I'll say perhaps a couple of words about why this happens. And the reason is as follows. So, so we have these two terms, this, this formula for the probability of, uh, of gluing the point x to the set A. So it's the probability that we hit x. So this is approximately a constant to an x is far from the set A. So, so this is for any reasonable random walk. Uh, it's at most one, and it's and it's not going to be very small. So this is not going to give us certainly anything, any power term. Uh, then we have the probability that we make a step from x to the set A. And finally, we have the probability from x that we reach the set A before we reach the set we return to x. And so what happens here? The probability, this term here, the probability that we make a step from x to a. So, OK, so let's assume for a minute that x is fairly far from a, that, uh, that the distance from x to a is bigger than the diameter. Then all the points in a have more or less the same probability of, of being hit. So this term is going to be on the order of, so we have the distance, let's uh, call it uh, rho, and we have, so we have the power of the distance is going, so we have rho to the minus alpha, which is the, to the minus alpha minus 1, I'm sorry, to the 1 minus alpha is the probability that we make a step of, uh, of exactly this size. Um, is it 1 or minus 1? Um, Minus one, sorry. Minus. So that's the probability that we make a step uh, from the point x to a particular point in the set A, and we have n points, so we get this kind of estimates. It's n times the probability of making uh, this particular step. Uh, here, so when alpha is between, when alpha is bigger than two. So if alpha is bigger than 2, then the probability that we return, we have approximately 
the distance to the power minus 1. So this is just a, a, a this is essentially the green function for for the random walk in two dimensions and it and you know how it decays for the random walk for, sorry, for the simple random walk in one dimension and you know how it decays so this is approximately 1 over rho but if alpha is less than 2 then the random walk doesn't is no longer in the domain of attraction of brownian motion and in fact now it's going to start looking like like different stable processes more closely and what you get here is exactly rho to the so at 2 it should be 1 so so you get here if I'm not mistaken rho to the alpha minus 1 or 1 minus alpha so So, so the end result of all this is that when you look at the ratio of these two things, uh, the alpha you get here and the alpha you get here exactly cancel out, cancel out. So, so on the one hand, so what happens is that on the one hand, if you're at a far away point, at, when a point is much farther, you're less, likely, you're less likely to make the large jump, but you're also likely to spend more time at that point. So, but you're and these two things exactly exactly balance each other so so in some sense what happens is that you have one thing that starts happening here which is uh, at alpha equals 3 which is that uh, the rate of growth big stops being summable but then here the greens function starts to change its behavior and and it stops it for a while um, in this argument so uh, this whole thing is only valid uh, for recurrent random walks and this the first term you said is a constant um, um, well in a way but but if the random walk is transient then uh, this whole formula uh, doesn't quite work so you need to look at the reverse walk and you need to look at escape probabilities and this happens uh, this transition happens at alpha equals 1 so if a random walk so so the z squared case which is exactly critical for recurrence is exactly at alpha equals 1 um, so if alpha is less than 1 the random walks are transient and you need different you need to use different methods yeah, the point is that if you start at x you will just never get to a never? what? you will never? get to a um, yes so somehow this mm -hmm. Yeah, so, but somehow working with the assumption that you get to A is what mm. Yeah. So, so, but you haven't ruled out, I have a question, you haven't ruled out the existence of other flat intervals. Right? So you know that there's a flat interval between 3 and infinity, and 1, 3, 1, and 2, but you, you have no convex, do you have, do you have some other argument to show that there are no other flat intervals? Um, so, so the answer is that we don't have any proof that there are no others, but but it's but if you make some, I believe that the answer is that you don't have any. Uh, so heuristically, if you assume that the set has some nice uh, fractal behavior, then you can say exactly what the growth is, and and be, so between two and three, uh, you get exactly the lower bound that we have. Um, so, well, so, as I said, uh, uh, this structure set for the aggregate is something that we don't know how to do. So, so, so there is a gap in, uh, so there is a gap between the lower bounds and upper bounds. Mm. So. Yes, yes, it's, uh, I, so I don't have any abstract argument either. Um, okay, so 
I maybe to finish, I'd like to ask to finish with one one more question for you. So, so there is this theorem that I mentioned about the about the harmonic measure for transient random walks. That if you have the harmonic measure for one set, you have them for all sets, and and this is equivalent to the fact that the green function uh, is slowly varying. So. So we want uh, g of x plus 1 divided by g of x to converge to 1 when, when x goes to infinity. Um, but the question is, when does this hold? So, so if, can you give some, some nice conditions on the random walk under which, under which this will hold? So g is the Green's function at x so it's so so g of x let's say it's the expectation starting from zero of of the number of uh, visits to x so so it's also equal to some constant times the probability starting from zero that you hit x at some finite time. So, so when when is the probability that you hit x and the probability that you hit x plus one more or less the same? Well, when if your larger. transition probabilities are sufficiently uh, differentiable, yeah. sufficiently smooth, then you can do a coupling of it. Yes. Um, yeah, so you want an if and only if condition? Well, uh, okay, so, so this is a general question. Uh, the, uh, an exact uh, condition would be the best possible answer. There are many possible, so there are many possible conditions under which it, it may be possible to prove this. And, uh, and it's really an open-ended question, and not looking for a particular, particular answer, but, but generally understanding when does this, understanding for which random walks does this hold and for which does it not hold. No, so so it's possible that the random walks, that different random walks with the same alpha will have different behavior. Uh, this, so as I said, uh, the different parts here use uh, all of them use some different techniques, and sometimes the general the general line of the proof is similar. But in order to get the estimates, you need different you need different techniques dealing with random walk. And uh, this means that uh, in different in different parts here we have different conditions on the random walk. So, so the nicest thing which satisfies uh, with all the conditions that we have is is just that you have uh, just that the probability of a large step is b is approximately t to the minus alpha. Um, for some of them, uh, for some parts, you it's possible to relax this just to have a finite alpha th moment. And if you, uh, so for some of the lower bounds, I think especially, uh, if the random walk is very is extremely bad, so if uh, if on different scales it uh, it behaves very differently, then I would expect that you will see this also in the in the aggregate that that for some ends you'll have a aggregate with one power and for other ends with different power, and in that case, so alpha only tells you the. So alpha will only tell you the largest power that you see, but but it's possible that you'll have periods of slow growth uh, at some scales. Uh, so it's uh, probably it's I would think it's also possible to prove some things like that uh, if the, if you have a random walk with steps that that fluctuate a lot.